Good afternoon from uh, my side. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, this is probably uh, a strange case to uh, to start with uh, your, your Europe from the outside seminars because uh, in the West, the Balkans, or as the political term of the Western Balkans was coined, is in effect uh, engulfed by EU member states. So it's it's in Europe. Uh, it's completely surrounded by European Union member states, so it's a very interesting case to look at how do we actually view the uh, European Union from this uh, backyard, as they like to call it. Uh, it's not really, because it's not really from the outside. It's looking from the inside, in, inside out into the European Union. Uh, so uh, it's on the one hand um, a uh, region that's very interconnected with the European Union, but uh, on the other, that still is seen as a part of European Union foreign policy. So it's outside of it. Can someone, can I, I'll just go a bit around. Can, I have a couple of hands, just to, when, you, when we say the Balkans or Macedonia, Serbia, whatever, can someone just give me a couple of the first words that come to your mind? Or just yell them out. Alexander Makedonsky, okay, that's a strange one to start with, but thank you, Alexander the Great. Okay, uh, something else? Yugoslavia, okay. Just so that I know what's the mental reference, it's nothing, it's, it's just so that I feel what's, uh, what's happening here. Because I did a lecture for the session two years ago online, but now it's good to see your faces, so I didn't get, I could not ask back then very uh, quickly, it was impossible to do it at the beginning, but, yes? Peacekeeper. UN, the UN peacekeepers. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Yes? Corruption. Thank you. Corruption, yes, rule of law issues and so on. Organized crime. That's, in many of the Western countries, that would be the first thing that would come to mind. Good food, anyone? No? Uh, okay, thank you, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Today's lecture is uh, entitled North Macedonia and the EU. We had to find some, let's see if I can use this, because I like to walk around. Yes, you can do it. Yeah? No. No? Should yes. be okay now. Wonderful. Um, Giovanni asked me what would be the title of the lecture. I'm very puzzled by these uh, titles, but let's see. We gave one a difficult past and an uncertain uh, future. Uh, thank you for the peace helmets, especially because that kind of brings us to some of the topics of the difficult past and the corruption, as that's in the answer to future, probably. Uh, we'll do a short overview. I will try to be not more than 14 minutes, 45 minutes, so that we have enough time for questions. Uh, but just as for you, an overview of what we're going to discuss uh, today. Uh, we'll do a bit of a, just two slides on how we view the Balkans theoretically, because this is a largely a uh, class that's supposed to reflect on some of the theoretical concepts of how we view the idea uh, of Europe from the outside. We'll do a bit of a background or, on North Macedonia. You see that is in brackets because it was not North up until 2019. It's changed its name. I, I was thinking I put that in the title, but maybe, maybe it was uh, deleted for different reasons. But I think it kind of conveys very much also the way that Europe is viewed from the outside or the demands that it puts on some of the countries. So, um, that's, those are very important brackets. We'll look at a bit of overview and basic cleavages in the country just so that you get a sense of what's happening there. And then we'll move on to uh, the EU enlargement and the Macedonian EU accession uh, story. And we'll reflect a bit on how is the EU and its member uh, states, how are the EU and the member states viewed from North Macedonia and uh, discuss a bit of the key dilemmas that are uh, ahead. Okay. Now, uh, when we look at the Western Balkans and in general and countries that are candidates, uh, we have to keep in mind that um, the traditional work on uh, the image of the EU as an actor from the outside is not the one that you primarily come to uh, frame these discussions in, uh, in research. Because uh, this is not the outside. So basically, when, he, when giving these countries the perspective of EU membership, they engage through separate uh, structures, they engage through separate policies, so um, most of us that see the union potentially through this lens use the 
theoretical framework of Europeanization, actually, which is something that's much more applicable to the EU member states and has been adapted to the use of the candidate countries through specific mechanisms, such as so-called conditionality. I might use this word down the road, and we'll, uh, we'll explain that uh, 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 as well for this for these purposes, because, I might, uh, because it might be beneficial for everyone. Um, so in the broadest terms, Europeanization, you know, it has a lot of, there's a lot of uh, arguments in literature, which are, we argue, what does it mean, does it mean anything? Uh, but uh, I tend to subscribe to this definition, which is of uh, Martin Bink and a couple of others uh, made a long time ago in 2007, which means that it's basically domestic adaptation to European regional integration. And there's a call, is this, this is a very simple definition of one, two, three, four, six words. And that refers to that this is domestic adaptation that can happen in the EU member states, but it happens also outside to the fact that European is re uh, EU is regionally integrating. And this is especially uh, important for candidate countries that view themselves as future member states because they have to adapt to the image of the European Union. And in order for you to do an agenda of adaptation to someone's image, that image needs to be good. So there is an intrinsic normative underpinning here that uh, the Europeanization is generally seen as a benevolent beneficial process to the countries, which is, the, which is a normative underpinning. We can discuss about that later. There is a lot of question marks there if it, uh, about, this, uh, about this black and white assessment. We'll reflect on that. But for theoretical purposes, and I think this was also coined much uh, for historically even earlier in the 1990s, that we have to view this as a normative project in, in itself. And this is the way that it's being used in, uh, in literature, but also by policymakers in, uh, in the Western Balkans. In parallel with this um, concept, we also use the concept of conditionality, which means that the European Union in the process of, especially membership, basically stipulates conditions for countries in order to become members. And that means a strategy of reinforcement by, re by uh, reward, uh, there's very much, there's a lot of discussions in the literature, how do we view this conditionality? There's two extreme sides. One of them is that it's basically putting up carrots uh, for some of the reforms, which me, uh, and that is a rational choice approach. Whereas uh, the other end is, um, are authors that argue that we need to view this as a process of its application rather than an uh, ideal type assumed power uh, relationship, which means that conditionality can change over time, it can have negative effects, but this is very much a process-driven uh, uh, approach. The second point that I'm ending here with the theoretical considerations, uh, the image of the Union out externally is shaped uh, by a multitude of actors. So from the outside, uh, traditionally, people the European Council, the European Commission, and so on. But then there's the 27 now EU member states, then there's differences between them, differences with, within them. So this image is also shaped by the fact whether we will have um, discordance, concordance, or the values between, that these uh, various multitude of factors represent. Um, in the Western Balkans, uh, also, a very uh, useful classification has been made uh, between the role of the European Union as an active player or a conflict resolution mechanism because the EU actually intervened in a lot of the conflicts in the region, including North Macedonia, and the framework for European integration, which are two different roles. You know, when the EU, on the sides of the, let's say, some of the its key representatives for whatever the high representative for a common foreign and security policy uh, intervenes, to solve conflicts, this is a very different role that the EU undertakes in comparison to the expectations of a country that is acceding to the conditions that it puts for membership. There is very, there is a lot of different mechanisms that are stipulated there. In the common foreign and security policy, you basically have the high representative, you have part of the European uh, external action service acting, whereas when we're talking about enlargement or accession, then you need to deal with the specific um, policies, sectors, agriculture, environment, and so on, the standards that the EU has, which means that different all actors are at play. All of them impact, this is a very complex picture, this is a very patchwork, well, it's a patchworky picture, but it is, it's, not an, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a simple way that 
the EU is viewed uh, is, the EU is viewed from these countries or from North Macedonia specifically countries succeeding in a way that makes it very difficult to distinguish which are the decisive actors at which moment that will shape the image of the Union. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, different signals that are coming in in various forms. Uh, in any case, uh, this, is, uh, this, is the, this is where we are, <laughs> to put it that way. Uh, so uh, North Macedonia is uh, at uh, uh, the, almost the bottom of this uh, uh, map. Uh, and uh, south, just to make it clear as to what I meant when I said it's engulfed or uh, uh, surrounded by a member state, south of North Macedonia and Albania is actually Greece. So there we have a new member state that's a member of Schengen, that's been a new member state from the 1980s. Um, east of North Macedonia is uh, Bulgaria, a new member state from 2007. Up we have Romania, Hungary, coming back to Slovenia and Italy. So, completely in the European Union. So that's why I said it's a very interesting way, to, it's, a, it's, a, it's a peculiar way to start the seminar, but we have to understand that this is, this, uh, this view, now Croatia is here just for, it used to be, there's a big debate on Croatia, it's, it's a member state, so it's not in the Western Balkans, but, uh, to, uh, but it's here on the map. Uh, regardless, uh, the um, image, uh, the, the image probably from, from this region that we would like to convey is one that's uh, within Europe. There's no contestation whether these countries are members of Europe, but outside of uh, the uh, European Union. I think this might be a theoretical discussion that Giovanni and his colleagues might be having as to what do we mean when we, see, uh, when we say uh, viewing Europe from the outside. But in any case, uh, this is a region that aspires to be, uh, to be seen as at least a, a, a European and to uh, become formally a member of the European uh, Union. Uh, just a bit of profile, uh, that whole region that we saw is more or less, uh, we, we'll discuss about the status in terms of application of EU membership, but it has most of the same place. Macedonia is very small, it has about 2 million uh, Inhabitants, it has about 2 million inhabitants now to 1.8 million. Uh, it's part of, you can see, it's basically, it means that the country lost uh, more than 10% of its population, its population in uh, the last uh, two decades. Uh, UN forecasts say that by about 2050-60 we will be down to 1.2 million, just as the trend uh, is all over Eastern Europe and a lot of the European Union member states um, as well. It's an ethnically diverse setting, so uh, you have various nationalities uh, living there, with Macedonians representing the minority, the majority of uh, about 60 uh, percent, Albanians about 25 percent of the population to 30, and then about another 10 to 12 percent of smaller other uh, communities. It's a transitional economy and a hybrid regime according to what, let's say, some of the uh, international indexes would, uh, would rate. And its GDP per capita is about 37, 38% of the EU, uh, which used to be the EU 28 uh, average. Uh, this is just a, couple of, uh, uh, just a couple of notes on, for example, what does the Bertelsmann uh, Transformation Index uh, state about the country. It's considered to be a defective democracy or a hybrid regime, depending on the, on the uh, assessment. Uh, its economic transformation is considered to be advanced, and then it has a semi-okay uh, governance index. In the, you, this does not mean a lot unless we see it in the regional, in the regional uh, context. Uh, you will see that most of them, most of these democracies are uh, basically considered to be, uh, to be defective in, uh, in the region. And uh, with uh, Bosnia specifically here to be considered a highly uh, defective, but that's a, that's a different uh, question. And uh, it's, a reason that, it's a region that's been stagnating in this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this shape with these assessments for a very uh, long period. But we also have to keep in mind the trend within the Europe or within the democratic world that it's not been very much positive in terms of democratic development or setting the example that we, uh, we discussed uh, previously. Um, so, um, how are the, what are the cleavages 
uh, within the country. Uh, the key is the ethnic cleavage, uh, which was actually amplified by a power sharing agreement in uh, 2001. Uh, which means that we have basically two uh, political uh, blocs, uh, ethnically uh, defined. Um, and uh, the key, uh, the other key cleavage or the other key discussion has been uh, the, have been the bilateral disputes with the neighbors that have blocked the European integration process of, uh, of the country. Um, let's go back to the history so that uh, let's go next to the history so that I use uh, for this and then I'll come back to the yeah, to the previous one. Um, what are the milestones? It basically uh, managed to have peaceful independence from Yugoslavia in 1991. Uh, one of the colleagues mentioned the blue helmets. Uh, many of the uh, research uh, would tell you that we ma Macedonia managed to do this because it actually uh, asked the UN to intervene or to step on its borders, having seen what is likely to happen in Bosnia and uh, uh, the rest of the uh, Yugoslav uh, republics. So basically, this is the first case in which uh, a, uh, the president at the time of the country uh, invited the United Nations to come and guard our borders. <laughs> This was not done before because the UN were seen as peacekeeping, uh, usually to step in afterwards. But uh, this is largely the presence of the UN is considered to have secured partly the uh, peaceful the, the peaceful disassociation from uh, from Yugoslavia. The country has always been uh, very uh, open internationally. Uh, uh, it was a member of the Council of Europe from the early 1990s. It established the relationship with the EU in terms of the bilateral relations, diplomatic relations in 1993, after it was blocked by, uh, by Greece. Um, and uh, the, um, it basically was in 2001, uh, we had a short conflict, uh, an armed conflict in the country, which introduced power sharing. Uh, with the uh, more extensive power sharing than, than what was the case before. 2001 is very important, and I might mention it a bit later as well, because this tells us um, also this is very important for the European integration pact of the country. Uh, in 2001, North, no, no, not then North, Macedonia signed its stabilization and association agreement with the European Union, which was considered as the first step of the recognition of the perspective of accession. 2001 is a very long time ago. 2001 is actually, uh, in, is actually the time when another country uh, signed its Stabilization Association Agreement, which is now a member state of the European Union for almost a decade. Macedonia, in the beginning of the 2000s, was actually the case that was running in parallel with Croatia. Um, so they started the path early on, and Macedonia was considered to be the better pupil. Because Croatia had, been, had come out uh, of, uh, the difficult, of the wars, had still much more um, autocratic leadership in the early 2000s, had much more uh, question marks over how it will deal with some of the refugees, internally displaced persons from its territory, which was not the case actually with, uh, with North uh, Macedonia. Macedonia was considered to be the good pupil, had a short-lived conflict, and then based in 2001, the uh, European, the Common Foreign and Security Policy Representative and NATO Secretary General at the time, basically sorted out this conflict, introduced the power sharing in exchange for the promise of European integration. So they were, we signed an agreement, which is uh, for those of you that are like the, uh, like the research conflict resolution or the role of European Union in foreign uh, policies. This is probably the, this was the brainchild of at the time of Javier Solana and George Robertson, but this is considered the best intervention of the European Union ever in terms of resolution of conflicts, because we had two very strong political figures who operated together. Javier Solana at the time was common foreign security uh, policy representative of the EU. He had just come from NATO, so he had pre his previous position was NATO, so he had a very security-oriented mind. And with close cooperation with NATO and the US, they basically considered the, the broader uh, intellectual public will say that, that, these, that these, they did stop a war in the country. But this was done in exchange for the perspective of European integration. So 
in North Macedonia, all of these difficult engagements of the EU, let's say this, the, we're not going, for those of you that are interested, we can go a bit later into what was the, the, the essence of the deal or coming now of the conflict, but for the purposes of this discussion to get today, we have to keep in mind that uh, the promises that uh, were made at the time by the European officials, and these are very public ones, uh, the, are that the road to Brussels, so the road to membership, goes through the implementation of this peace agreement, which was called Ohrid. So there was a very uh, colloquial use, the road of Brussels goes to Ohrid. Ohrid is a very pretty lake in the south of uh, Macedonia, where the agreement was signed. But this had the symbolic, this had a symbolic um, uh, element of the, how the EU was actually viewed. So it was viewed as a peacemaker, but also as a potential goal uh, for improving the country democratically, politically, and so on. And from that moment, from that engagement with the European Union, the European Union membership became a cohesive force between the different communities. That's why I mentioned the ethnic structure before. Because if everyone was in this, the EU was supporting this power sharing agreement, it was a signal also to all of the communities in the countries, the, let's say Macedonians and Albanians, if we work on this and we make this country work, we will become, there's more likelihood that we will become members of the Union. So these are very specific roles that the Union is taking uh, on, on itself at uh, the time. Um, fast forwards, there's a big fast forward for those of you that are interested, we'll talk about that uh, later, but uh, there were a lot of trials and tribulations in the meanwhile. Um, the country being a good pupil in this period from 2005, uh, got a candidate status in 2005 for EU membership, again together with Croatia. So in 2005, Montenegro was not a country because it was together with, you know, with uh, Serbia in the uh, Union. Kosovo did not have independence. Serbia was engulfed in its own problems. So none of the region actually across Macedonia was the, was the exception. Um, in 2005, it became a candidate status for EU, uh, for EU membership. And it was uh, very well transforming also its military. So it was supposed to um, accede in 2008 uh, in uh, NATO. Because, as I said, it was always very much open. It's never had uh, it, uh, a question mark over its European, Euro-Atlantic integration. Do any of you know who became, which countries became members of NATO in 2008? George W. Bush stood up at the summit in Bucharest uh, on that May on that summit and said tomorrow three countries will become members of the of NATO. Uh, on, needless to say, on the next day, two countries became uh, members of NATO. Uh, one was Croatia, uh, and one was the other one was Albania. Uh, the one that was left out was uh, Macedonia at the time because of its dispute with Greece resurfaced. So, despite everything being sorted. Uh, Greece actually blocked Macedonia's, uh, uh, this is a very old story, it had objections to the use of the name Macedonia, I mentioned that uh, in the early 1990s, and this uh, conflict resurfaced. Uh, and uh, Greece in effect put a uh, veto on, uh, on Macedonia's accession to NATO. For those of you that are interested in US foreign policy, usually if you ask the five to ten biggest foreign policy blunders of, blunders of the United States, this would be one of them. It was clear that George W. Bush was about to depart, so this was a very uh, this was seen also as a blow from Greece to the U.S. But this was for them a strategically important issue, and this is the moment where actually uh, question marks start to appear also in North Macedonia as to how much is the, the, the EU, how much are the EU and NATO actually uh, actually devoted uh, devoted to us. The same veto was transferred in the European Union in 2009, because in 2009. Uh, Macedonia, after a specific delay, was actually uh, uh, assessed by the European Commission to be able to start the accession negotiations for membership. And that veto stayed in the European Union uh, Council up until 2017, when the country actually, uh, 18, when the country actually changed its name to North Macedonia. So this is the reason, in very simple terms, why uh, the country changed uh, its name in 2019. After changing the name, you will see the one, uh, the bullet uh, just before the last one, we did become a member of NATO. 
uh, in the pandemic in 2020 after the uh, name change. Uh, and from 2020 to 2022, uh, unfortunately, the country suffered another blow on the European integration when Bulgaria decided to use a veto uh, in, uh, in the case of North Macedonia and to veto the start of its accession talks. Because Giovanni here nicely read that the country from 2020 actually um, had a decision to open the accession negotiations. Um, I want to do this again. So uh, this story of what we have uh, and the numerous vetoes uh, leads to this support for EU accession at the moment in the country. The line at the top uh, shows you how from 2014 to 2021, this, the number of people that actually do respond positively on the question if there is a referendum next week for membership of the Republic of North Macedonia in the EU, which is a very good indicator of how the country, the, the, country is, the EU is viewed from the outside, has been dropping. And, uh, from 80 to about 68, this is not a bad figure still. This is not a bad figure, given the path that we have had, the very difficult path of uh, playing with, uh, with the vetoes. Um, there is a drop in the number of people that would say that they're against and they don't know, but uh, this number used to be about 90 in 2005, when we had a lot of enthusiasm and so on and so forth. These numbers are much, more, are much worse if you ask uh, the, the people, the population, do you trust the European Union? Is the EU a powerful actor? And so on. Uh, then we get to very bad numbers to about, at this point, there are a range about 10% of people that actually trust the, uh, trust the European Union. So the effect of this, um, of this dip difficult uh, path has been, uh, has been actually a, a relative drop in, uh, for European uh, integration. The risk here is that we all know from literature that the, the support for European integration tends to decrease as countries go through very difficult reforms. We will see what kind of an impact this will have in the, in the long term. Uh, and uh, this is something that we have uh, gone through uh, so that we have time for questions. But um, let's see, just to reflect, uh, uh, the country did start the EU accession earlier than the others in the region. It was a country of uh, the first attempts of the European Union. So it's viewed largely as very much interlinked with common foreign and security policy in the European Union and with, with the way that the EU shapes its role outside. So that's why it's very uh, important. It, it was the first also to have a mission under the common foreign and security policy of the European Union in 2001. We had the first stabilization association agreement in the region. Um, and. Uh, we also had the first suspension of an accession negotiations uh, recommendation, but that's a different story and probably for those of you that are very interested. Um, so broadly, the way that uh, the, the EU is viewed from North Macedonia is through the enlargement lens. Like it or not, that's a way to view uh, the EU from, uh, from the outside. Uh, for us here, I mean, the, the EU has been enlargement since its, since its establishment. Uh, this is just an introductory slide for that, but um, for most of the region, for most of the people in North Macedonia, the EU is viewed through this foreign policy goal. And this is a goal that is considered largely successful. We have a lot of discussions now whether enlargement was a success. We use Hungary, we use Poland. Then on the other hand, there's Estonia, which is at the moment the fourth country that has the freest media in the world. So. We can discuss about that a bit later. This is a cup that you can view as half full or half empty. Probably after the 24th of, of February this year, a lot of people see it as a much, much fuller than it, they saw it before. But from this region, the expectations from uh, North Macedonia and more broadly even across the region for people that actually support European integration of the, of the Western Balkans is that uh, the EU will have the effect on this region as it did on the countries of the 2004 and 2007 enlargement. Very, put it very simply, the mental reference is that the EU has been in recent history used as a transformative model, so this is what we, this is what we, uh, we expect. Uh, we went through this. Unfortunately, what we've seen in the case of, uh, and I think the North Macedonia case clears that, shows that very clearly, 
Um, after the Eastern enlargement, uh, there is a very, uh, there is a big sense of disappointment with uh, the European Union. Uh, there is a big, uh, the, instead of a lot of the enthusiasm that we saw in 2004 and 2007, most of the buzzwords that are related to the Western Balkans enlargements, if this goes to Macedonia, is whether the EU will have the absorption capacity to integrate these countries. When we are talking about the absorption capacity, I have to make, I removed that slide, I should have had. Does anyone know how many people actually live in all of these six countries of the Western Balkans? Any guess? Not more than 16 million people. This is, by any comparison, tiny in all six of them. All of them will probably today, if you see how many people they have, this is less than 0.5% of the population of the Union. This is for the European Union, in essence, peanuts. Going back to a lot of the problems that you mentioned of corruption and all of that, I'm not trying to undermine those, but in effective terms, also in terms of the economy and so on, these are increasingly interlinked so the, the countries, so the absorption capacity does not stand in many ways on, 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 as an argument on very strong, uh, strong legs, but it is what it is. I think the failure is the enlargement fatigue, the problems that were probably not resolved with the previous enlargement in terms of the decision making of the Union, because that's the moment when the Union actually went with the instruments conceived for six, then for 15, then went to 28. Now, whether the, detriment, the completely detrimental effect will come from these countries that are yet to come, that's a different story. The other words that have been used are, yeah, corruption or this, this new element of so-called that the region is just too, too bad, just the region, they can't, it can't be dealt with because it's state captured, there's too much corruption, there's too much organized crime, uh, and so on. And uh, there has been the question of whether the EU is actually interested in working on uh, building these countries as member states, or is just interested in providing stability. Uh, in, in, over that, for the European, most of the European <coughs> Union member states, it would be just fine not to have wars in this region, and that's about it, because it's actually a very uh, uh, a good source of labor for some of the European for the European Union uh, member states, and it's also a very important migration route, uh, where some of the EU rules were completely inappropriately uh, exported, and this was, uh, this was uh, seen in the 2015-16 uh, refugee crisis, and we can talk about that uh, a bit later. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, you, I, I, uh, yeah it's good. I'm not, not sure if you can read this. What are, I think the image of the European Union from the outside in, in North Macedonia, this is the best slide to, be, to, to use. Why are actually people supporting EU membership? So what, what do they expect? What's their personal thing? Uh, uh, the mantra in the Balkans was that the NATO accession on North Macedonia provides security and stability, and the EU will provide for complementary economic development. Uh, that's why I put the GDP uh, on the first slide. They expect improvement of standard of living. This does not change over the years. You have the data here from 2014 to 21. They expect reduction of unemployment, and still, a comparative number of people expect improvement of democracy and uh, easier access to uh, jobs uh, abroad. So there's a variety of reasons, but still we see that this um, uh, normative element uh, actually uh, prevails, that still Europe, with all of the question marks, is seen is is seen, or the process of actually uh, becoming European Union, a European Union member state is seen in a positive, uh, in a positive light. Um, this is just for entertain, not that much for entertainment purposes, but um, these are two photos of uh, the ceremony for signing the agreement with Greece, when we actually said we will change uh, our, uh, we, the, the government committed to changing the name also for internal use. I put them up here. On the first picture, you have the signatories, the two prime ministers uh, at the time, and the two ministers of foreign affairs. And on the next picture, on that same celebration of the uh, of the signing, you have the enlargement commissioner, Johannes Hahn, together with them, and the representative of the European Union for Common Foreign and Security Policy, Federica Mogherini, at the time as well. Denoting the support that the European Union uh, provided to this uh, to this uh, whole uh, agreement with uh, between the two countries, 
And under that, you have a quote from uh, the BBC that said that th this looked like a setting for a wedding. Um, the probably uh, the the well, the the name change of the country was uh, put for a referendum in the public. And I put here the question for you, just also to 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 go back to the argument of how even from the beginning of the early 2000s, a lot of the difficult uh, discussions on power sharing and here on conflict resolution with our neighbors, or this time uh, it was Greece, were put uh, in the framework of uh, EU and NATO, uh, EU integration or the role of the EU outside. Uh, so the question that was put to the public for the referendum is actually, was not directly linked to the agreement with Greece, but was framed in the following manner. So we were asked, are you in favor of EU and NATO membership? as if this was a referendum of the EU and NATO membership, by supporting the agreement between Macedonia and Greece, which basically meant to signal to the public that if you're against the agreement, then you're against EU and uh, NATO uh, membership of the country. Uh, so these are, well, although in effect the change of the name does not have substantive relations with any of the EU policies in terms of building an EU member state, to be, to be fair, uh, so this was probably the start of the compromising on a lot of the EU uh, merit-based uh, approaches and a lot of the normative values for the public. And this was the first time when a lot of the public actually felt that, we, that the European Union might not be such a benevolent actor due to a uh, variety of, uh, of reasons. Now, I have a couple of just uh, two or three more slides and then we'll end it up. Uh, I, one of the, I've covered now basically how the EU has approached us both through a conflict resolution uh, approach and both through a, the, the, the hurdles that we had to go through uh, with uh, the member states. Uh, but the last point where I left you in terms of my first two slides, how do we see this theoretically, was that there's a multitude of actors here. It's not just the Commission or Mogherini and Han that we saw or uh, Josep Borrell now. Uh, the position towards the key EU member states. Uh, these became very much important because uh, largely uh, it was realized that the key EU member states are not really keen on seeing this region as a, uh, as a part of the European Union, maybe, uh, in terms of membership. But Germany is largely seen as a driver and supporter of, uh, of the country and also of the membership, as opposed to France. France is perceived as a rather ambivalent actor, and even an opponent to uh, opponent to enlargement. Traditionally, uh, the economic links that Germany has with the region are incomparable to what France has uh, in the region, with the exception of Serbia. France has uh, a very much a focus on Serbia. Most of the other countries are in the in the second uh, in are uh, uh, in the second tier of relationship. Uh, and uh, I would not uh, also uh, forget that Hungary is an important actor uh, in the region as a neighboring country, as a country that also asserted a specific role during the 2015-16 refugee crisis uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of the Balkan migration route, closing it, not closing it, and so on, and the signals that were sent to, to the region at, uh, at uh, the time. Hungary, um, in effect, in my opinion, uh, just as in the EU context, tends to play, as, tends to have performed the role of a spoiler, uh, because uh, the the image that it sets provides arguments to those people that would question, in many ways, the effectiveness or the validity of the EU goal or the EU image from from uh, the outside. Uh, this is a. Um, let me see if you can just read it. How strongly? Yeah. What well, this is the perception or the support for maintaining strong links and relationships with specific uh, countries, and we see that the EU, Germany, and the United States are among the most prevalent uh, in in North Macedonia. Russia is very uh, is a very weak actor. We can go back to that. It's not been interested in North Macedonia, unlike in other countries uh, in the region. Um, what uh, we uh, ended up in uh, 
2019 uh, or in 2020, what we've looked at on the other side of the of the coin is very much also to be aware that uh, the this drive of North Macedonia to view the EU as a positive image has, has rather been questioned from the support for further enlargements in, in the EU. This is data from 2019, which was not very uh, positive. Uh, generally, you see uh, on uh, the top of the list the new EU member states, with the exception of Spain, that has traditionally been supportive of enlargement, whereas at the bottom are some of the key EU member states, such as Germany, uh, even France, that utterly oppose further EU enlargement. So we have to also, when we talk about this image from the outside, we have to be aware with the public opinion on the inside, which is shaped and reshaped from, from various reasons. But let's say the data from the last couple of years have shown us that the public in the European Union is also not very inclined towards enlargement, with the exception, as I said, of Spain and the new EU member states. However, uh, the 2022 data from, uh, this is I think the Bertelsmann Foundation again, has for the first time uh, we, we see probably this is probably the effect of Ukraine and uh, uh, the uh, uh, 24th of February. For the first time, we see a uh, change in this uh, this mood around the European Union uh, in basically having a, reaching a number of about 70 percent of uh, the public in the EU 27. Uh, that are actually supporting of further EU enlargements in the next five years or, or uh, a decade. And this would be, this, whether this is a short-term experience of actually uh, watching the war uh, unfold, uh, whether it will be a long-term development, we will see. Uh, but uh, in, the, let's say, in the country, uh, in, in the region of the Western Balkans, the mood in the European Union as to further accessions is very, is very closely uh, watched because this is something that would also shape uh, the uh, national positions and this was likely to see as a possible game changer in, in the short term. But we have seen some uh, such, we have seen uh, uh, at times historically such big events can have a very short term effect and then they go back to business as usual. So whether this is a sustainable trend that will help these com the countries that are uh, exceeding or that are in the pipeline, uh, we, will, uh, we, will, we will see. Uh, I'll leave you with a couple of key dilemmas uh, that mm, are existent in North Macedonia. I go to the uh, media a lot and probably these are some of the key questions that also the journalists tend to ask. Uh, will we ever actually li live to see EU membership in the form that we're hoping for? I mean, this is not an invalid question if you go back to the fact that the country signed the stabilization agreement in 2001. Uh, I am 40, uh, I just turned 40 in uh, May this year. I have been working on this for a long time, <coughs> for 17 years now, and I, needless to say, when I started working, I just hope we would be uh, in a different state than we are uh, today. So there's really uh, question marks as to the, whether this will be a project within a certain lifetime. And if it's not seen as a project within a certain lifetime, then it, it significantly undermines the, the, its potential for success. The other question is what kind of EU will we if we join it? Here we have the post-pandemic differentiated union. Just the other day we had the first summit of the European political community uh, we see uh, a lot, th th these are, uh, the question of differentiated integration uh, is one that, for example, when I was studying the European Union, was considered to be a blasphemy, uh, if, you, if you ask me, in the early 2000s, because the EU should strive, there's an article in the, in the treaties that said every member state is treated equally, uh, and uh, this was seen as largely to undermine the role of the European Union. Today, these discussions are not that uh, are not uh, are not peripheral uh, and are much more widely uh, widely accepted. Uh, the other question that we hear that you would get in terms of North Macedonia is basically: Is a small multi-ethnic country sustainable down the road? And uh, this is also because in this region, this might be probably the only multi-functional, the multi-ethnic functioning democracy. 
uh, I think are reflected the immigration and their population as a, as, a, as a problem. Also because most of these people do live even now in the European Union. This will only get worse with membership likely unless you create a system that is operational uh, at home. And the bigger question of actually a rule of law in the European uh, Union, which reflects us to the question of how the, the EU, EU deal with questions of corruption and questions of organized crime outside. Because sometimes the standards that it says are from outside and are used as um, gatekeeping mechanisms, but unfortunately uh, for uh, many of the people uh, uh, in the region that genuinely support this normative element from where I started from, the expectation that Europeanization will help us move forward in the, um, in the democratic rule, uh, have a very valid question, pose a very valid question when they see some of the developments in uh, terms of rule of law within the uh, EU member states. Uh, okay, I was a bit longer than I planned. Thank you for your attention. I'm here for uh, questions. Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Simonida, and now uh, immediately you can open the floor to your questions, remarks, comments, uh, and so on. We have uh, a wonderful flying microphone, which in Italian we call uh, ice cream, mm? and so uh, it is ready for you, so of course uh, don't be shy, and so on. Otherwise, I have many questions, but of course... So it can serve as an icebreaker, but we don't need, I think, any icebreaker in a context of climate change, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, the floor is yours. Yes, no, you have to wait for the microphone, please. Yes. I can hear. I'm still not. Uh, yeah, but the camera... No, <laughs> no, no I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about uh, the perception of EU in uh, your country. Is it mostly a mean to solve some internal problems or regional problems you have there? Or, uh, I don't know, I was born in a member state and uh, in a founding member state, uh, so EU was always uh, there and they told me it was kind of a political goal or a long term a political goal. Is it perceived this way uh, on, uh, in the Balkans, or is it a mean to solve some uh, more uh, urgent uh, thing that no problem? That's that. Yes. Would you like to 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 reply now, or if there are a bit more, we can collect it. Or yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Three. Maybe. Yeah. And then there is mine. No, 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 yours no. No, I cannot resist. <laughs> yours to the end. So I wanted to ask if uh, the relationship between I mean, the ethnical perceived uh, between Armenian and Macedonian has changed with with the COVID and uh, the war and so on. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, another one, maybe, or not? Other questions? No, sorry. Other, Other questions? questions? Yes, there is one. Yes, from Brazil. Brazil. Uh, I'd like to you talk a bit more about that dilemma you said uh, for uh, about the population as joining uh, the group of EU things free circulation of people. Um, I expect that the Zillion will be immigrating into the world. And uh, what are the expectations of uh, people from Macedonia? Getting out of the country, uh, even more to other member states. So basically, what are uh, your expectations from you? Okay. Is it enough for the first round? No, there's no more. Ah, okay, one more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, my name is Ronnie Wurms, the important diagnosis of Macedonia, and uh, only for security problems or not. Okay, Monita, please. Do you want yours or later? <laughs> later. <laughs> okay, don't want to discourage you. Uh, wonderful. Um, uh, let's start with the ethnic uh, dimension. Um, the uh, power sharing agreement that uh, was introduced in 2001 uh, goes back to some of the grievances that uh, the Albanian community had in the early 1990s, uh, but um, the key mm, dimension of it has been actually uh, increased rights of the use of languages, increased rights of uh, public administration representation, and so on, to remedy some of the uh, inequalities that existed uh, before. This brings me to your question on, on COVID. The risk of COVID has been yeah, to amplify the inequalities or to, to exacerbate the existing inequalities of those that are already vulnerable would be much more uh, left to the, uh, would be left behind. Uh, fortunately, um, this uh, inequality in North Macedonia at the moment is not purely, uh, is not purely ethnic because in the last 20 years, the balancing out of rights or the, the, the inequality cleavage has not been the mainly this Macedonian Albanian one ethnic one. The, the most vulnerable group, just in, is most of the European countries, uh, are the rural uh, women of uh, ethnic descent that live distantly from the capitals and that usually have care responsibilities uh, of every sort that made uh, basically COVID their functioning completely impossible and completely enclosed them in their homes. But this is a general, uh, this is a general uh, impact that it has had all over Europe. Whether the country has had enough funds or whether it can plan effectively to remedy this in comparison to what was done in a developed country, that's a different question and I think we've, we failed to do that. I, most of us failed to do that because of the, a lot of the abrupt ways in which policies were made. Uh, the war. Uh, the war brings me to the question of Russia, which is very important in the, in the case of North Macedonia, which, which probably a lot of people will tell you that uh, the, the multi-ethnic dimension of the country and the clear link and association uh, between the Macedonian and Albanians was one of the reasons why Russia did not try to effectively intervene as it did in the other countries. Because for the Albanian community all over the region, both Kosovo, Albania and parts of North Macedonia, Russia is not a partner. They don't, they don't see Russia in their uh, mental map, and it's a no-go, despite of the fact that the majority of the, of the country, would, the Macedonian, would be orthodox. The links with Russia were never, were never, uh, were never strong. Also because uh, the Church of North Macedonia, the Macedonian Church, uh, was not actually officially recognized by the Russian Church. So you, this was also a vehicle of uh, uh, influence that was non-existent. So in this sense, um, the war and, uh, has not made much of an impact on, on the, uh, the inter-ethnic uh, dimension. Um, what has had an impact, uh, and this has tainted the image of the, of the European Union, but this I felt would, go, would be going into too much details, was the Bulgarian veto that I mentioned uh, at the bottom, because uh, I think that in, uh, this is just overcomplicated in some way, but uh, it's not, but it goes back to the essence of your, of your question. Um, Bulgaria's, uh, unlike Greece's veto, which was linked to the name of the country and uh, so on, uh, Bulgaria has put forward conditions which um, go, which attack some of the basic foundations of the Macedonian state, but which reflect the majority community primarily, because all of these concessions, both for Greece in the name of European integration, both for Bulgaria in the name of European integration again, were um, uh, affecting the, some form of an identity marker of the Macedonian majority community. Uh, and for the Bulgarian requests went to actually discussions on the origins of the language, uh, which they linked it again to our European accession. It, uh, the Bulgarian demands also went back to historical issues discussing the role of specific historical figures, which again uh, relate only to the Macedonian community. So when the EU sided, and they did largely with some of these Bulgarian requests, 
this was the moment when the EU was seen as an unprincipled actor, and this was what created a rift inter-ethnically. Because for the Albanians, let's say nothing that was sacred for them was that, I mean, this is very oversimplification, but this is the cleavage that has been created in recent year, in, 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 uh, since July practically and in the last two years. But the Macedonian community tends to feel that a lot of these demands affect their identity markers. And this is the risk that we have, uh, uh, that we have down, uh, down, the, down the road. Um, the uh, perception, uh, the, the other questions were more really related to the, to the EU. Uh, how do the, does the public perceive the EU? Um, I cannot stress enough that the, the main uh, image of the, the filter for the uh, public perception of the European Union is the experience of the 2004 and 2007 EU member states. So what is expected is that the EU will basically help the country to transform to the standards of the European Union. And as I say, the European Union standards are not far away from us. I mean, this is, these are very, very much as a result of that stabilization association agreement that I mentioned in 2000. These, this region, and especially North Macedonia, is very interconnected with the European Union. This goes back to your question of the expectations. Um, this, the people of this region already live to the European Union, even now. Um, Germany has specific quota specific pro programs to actually attract workforce from the region. Uh, so the, we do not expect such a dire effect of uh, the membership, per se, on the population that would be much more different than what the country is actually experiencing now. The broader expectation, and this links the two questions together, is that the European accession process or the external power of the European Union that it exhibits through the European accession process is seen as a transformative vehicle that will help the country deal with the corruption, deal with the organized crime, that will help it, it administratively, and that will, in the short and medium and long term, make the country a better place to stay or even return from where you were uh, at this point in this limbo of uh, the waiting room. In any way, more people will, we, we, the assessments are that people are anyway going to leave. You can't keep them, you can't engross them uh, in a certain bubble. Um, also, uh, probably this is something that we should have, uh, we don't have the time to, be, uh, to mention, but these, uh, although that experience is now uh, already fading completely as the generations are dying off, we also have to keep in mind that this, the, the region of former Yugoslavia was actually unlike the other parts that were under uh, communist uh, rule during the, uh, between in the 50 years after the Second World War, was not actually a closed off setting. Migration has always happened traditionally in this part of, uh, of the world. I mean, the, the holders of these passports, Yugoslav, Macedonian, and so on, prior to 1990, had the right to travel. They had one of the strongest passports in the world. They had the right to travel both in the West and both in the non-aligned countries. And I think this shapes mentally the uh, attitudes towards migration that is a bit different than what was the case in countries that were very much... Uh, that would, were very closed off to, to, the, rest of the, to the rest of the world. Uh, a security problem or not a security problem? Um, I said at the beginning, that's why I gave the two frameworks. Um, the, there is a part, there is a segment, there is a truth in both. Uh, the EU has been very much uh, dealing with security issues in this, uh, in this region, which is normal given the given that there was a war 20-something years ago. There was a war not in, in Macedonia, there was a short-lived conflict, but then we, we have Kosovo next to us, there is Bosnia. Uh, so the whole region, uh, probably also the expectations that would put forward for solving out or for using this panacea of European integration that we will do everything in 10 years, uh, disregarding how difficult the structural conditions were, was not, was not, uh, was not a good one. The fact of life remains that the, the region is engulfed here, and it's a question on the European Union members whether they will also try to think more strategically in the long term in terms of the development of the region, rather than actually treating it purely as a security, as a security issue. The treatments depend on the, on the, period, uh, in, um, on the period, also on the, the circumstances in the EU. I can uh, sign with both hands that in 2015 and 16, when we had the refugee crisis, 
this region was treated purely through a security dimension. So th the primacy was on ensuring that, for example, North, they're putting pressure at a certain point on, on North Macedonia to profile the refugees at the border with Greece and to uh, do some of the pushbacks that the European Union did not want to do. I mean, it's not a, it's practically common sense uh, at this point. How do these actions of the European Union actually affect its image outside and whether they, at the same time a trade-off was made between the uh, commitment to some democratic standards and uh, the needs of the Union by, as seen by some actors? that we can discuss to the, to the latest. Then there were, area, there were periods, for example, between 2005 and 2009, when things were very calm in the country, when it was advancing, when we lived to see the visa liberalization process, because we have free visa travel, uh, most of the region, with the exception of Kosovo, unfortunately, returned its rights to travel freely to the European Union for tourism purposes, as I did, for example, this time, but from 2000, this is existing from 2009. So uh, at that point, I think with some of the, then to, uh, as we are in Italy, it's probably fortunate to say that there have been a lot of good people from Italy at the EU policy making level that have made such wide decisions as Franco Frattini did at the time with, yeah. the, with the visa liberalization dialogues because everyone knows that this was um, in a way some of the best use of EU conditionality uh, example. If anyone wants to uh, say something that they do not disagree with me, I'm also fine. <laughs> no, it's my turn. Ah, yes. You're but patient my, enough. Yes. No, but it's, my, my question is very easy. Eh? That is, uh, and, uh, I, <laughs> no, I want to uh, just. Um, so it's about the first dilemma, right? That is, uh, that is, we will live uh, to see EU membership. But what, so that is, what was the reaction, if any, in uh, uh, North Macedonia uh, to the uh, quick prospect of uh, accession offered to Ukraine? Yes, that's a very valid question. Uh, I was hoping to tackle it in the in the in the questions as well. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, um, I just hosted uh, on last week, before I came here, I think on Thursday, we had a group of ten think tankers, representatives of governments and academia from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, on a um, study visit in the Western Balkans on, uh, on how to actually understand or assist or to, how to prepare for what's next. Um, for uh, I'm uh, the I don't think that the public the, the general public uh, was a bit puzzled. Now we have to say because um, uh, there's the EU has put just so many demands on these countries. I mean, in our case, it was not linked directly because the formal status was different. But let's say the comparable status of this uh, of the Ukraine case is Bosnia. Because Bosnia has been now, for example, for years uh, trying to get candidate status of the European, from the European Union. They have one questionnaire, then another questionnaire, then, uh, then other conditions. Then, I mean, this has been about five or six years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Bosnia has a track record of dealing with the, with the European Union um, integration. Um, so I think that this is the, was felt the most uh, there. But then at the same time, this region also understands uh, war and uh, you and conflict. Unfortunately, I mean, I would, we were lucky enough in, in Macedonia not to have it, that much of a comparable experience. But this is also a region that understands war, but it also understands political signaling. So I don't think that people were per se uh, disappointed. You know, but um, the big question uh, was, uh, and the, the big expectation was that, like, will the EU now actually get its grip? and deal with, it, with enlargement properly rather than putting it to the side. Because, you know, there was even on the broader uh, public, they were like, okay, now Ukraine matters to them, so maybe they will move us as well. I mean, this is a very cynical way, but it, it, this was the general mood was this one. Because, you know, because it, Ukraine matters at this point, so we can, um, we can expect some movement uh, as to what will happen. Um, just as a reflection, we are expecting uh, the, the European Commission does every year these reports on the candidate countries. 
uh, that are in the accession process that they introduced from the Eastern enlargement from 1997. And uh, they happen regularly every October usually. And this is the week they're supposed to come out on Wednesday. But now the big uh, fight within the Commission, and we still don't have a confirmation whether this will happen, is because there are um, countries uh, in the EU, and I think even Italy might be one of them, but now with the change of government, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Austria is for sure one of them that have now uh, basically said that Bosnia has to be granted a candidate status in these given circumstances practically this week. So uh, that's why the, there's a lot of... Uh, they are uh, on, on hold, uh, to put it mildly. Um, the big question that a lot of us have, and we are really trying not to be cynical with our Ukrainian colleagues when they come, because there is a lot of enthusiasm there, which reminds us of the enthusiasm that we had in the early 2000s. So we really try not to kill it off. Uh, but the big question is that, I mean, if, if, the EU, if the, their path resembles ours, then you know you're not sure about this, all of these values and the and the defense that of democracy that is being uh, that is being uh, discussed. Also, that brings me to the Bulgaria question because uh, there's uh, if if uh, this model of allowing some of these historical disputes, historical issues to be intervened with the accession process that was foreseen as a transformation of uh, the institutions and policies. Um, there, is, there are big questions as to how will some of the, of the Pandora box that you're opening, because we already know that uh, you, Hungary has announced some grievances on many issues with uh, Ukraine, uh, also with Moldova. Poland has already announced, despite the support, the, the support that it's politically giving, that it, it tends to, to deal with the ways that some of the World War II issues are being discussed in Ukraine. So this is the question that uh, a lot of us also have as to the down the, the long-term effect of this. Okay. Any other questions from you? Yes, there is one. Two. Okay. Huh? Three. Huh? <coughs> down there. Yeah. So thank you for the presentation. I'm uh, a great team from the University of Thessaloniki in Greece. Yes. Yeah. I know what Thessaloniki is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what the name Thessaloniki for the last time. I can imagine. <laughs> this is work for the students, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> not for you, of course. Yes. Right, so first question about your future elections in 2024. Okay. So do you think that the federal government will be withdrawn from the agreement of Presta? Second question, whether do you think that EPC Other questions, which is in line with the mm -hmm. 
uh, and it is about the economic consequences of um, you know of accession to the European Union. That is, is there any any debate in uh, you know among political parties or in civil societies about uh, the economic consequences of accession? That is, because accession means can mean, for example, uh, liberalisation. Uh, neoliberalism also and uh, for example I know that in Bosnia which is not even a candidate country it is a potential candidate country there were uh, social movements and so mm -hmm. on fighting against uh, the, the potential neoliberal consequences of, of, uh, of accession mm -hmm. of European integration and so on and so forth Thank you uh, to, to our neighbors first. Ah. I, yes, uh, just for the clarification of the other, so the, the agreement that we signed with Greece is called the, the PRESPA agreement. Uh, PRESPA is yet another lake. So the, the lake in the background, these photos are nearly, well, not very good, but the scenery is tremendous. So PRESPA is another lake that's on the border with Greece, so hence the symbolic na name of the, uh, of the agreement. Um, the opposition in North Macedonia, uh, which is a um, which associates itself with the Europe with the European People's Party, is the party we're talking about. So Vomero de Pomona is the um, country that or is the uh, national uh, party that is a member of the that it belongs to the family of the European People's Party, but is traditionally close to. Uh, Orban, that uh, this, this is the reason why why I mentioned it. Um, they were uh, the mm, the government that signed, they were in opposition when the government signed the uh, agreement with Greece, um, and uh, the big uh, they had to uh, be very uh, wise or unwise. They had to find a way which was practically uh, impossible to opposed this agreement because they disliked the fact that the name was changed for internal use, so uh, internally in all our documents primarily, without being against EU. And that was a very tricky path uh, to take, just as a background for the other, for the other colleagues. So uh, after this strange referendum, a vote took place in Parliament uh, of actually of ratifying this agreement. And they uh, did not vote against. They left the parliamentary hall in, as a sign of protest, which is what they did also with the Bulgarian proposal. Because a lot when these strange proposals or th these concessions come with the EU flag on top of it, it's very difficult for the actors here in North Macedonia to actually say no, because there is broader support for European integration and because they will be labeled as anti-European. This is a very thin line to walk. It's like they're walking here, basically. So what they, and they try to, to get around it. I mean, they, they've been put in this position, so it's a very strange position to be in. Uh, and uh, then they oscillate. We will annul the agreement, we will not allow, annul the agreement. When they won on the local elections, when they brought mayors to power, their, ma their mayors on the first session uh, did not use the, the North Macedonia name. So they filed statements only with Macedonia uh, of what the response of the administration was. This, this is unconstitutional. Now you have to bring them back. So this was a one-day event. So I don't think in the long term they are... I started with the European People's Party because they might have these strange occurrence, uh, uh, appearances at certain times, but in the end, the association with the European... with their European political party families, and this was also very much important, uh, legitimizes their role in the country, also for the, gov for the uh, governing party at the moment and their association to the Social Democrats and the uh, European People's Party. So I don't, they, I don't think they will go against. There may be, uh, even if they win, and they are, uh, they are likely to win. Uh, the bigger question for probably that I uh, should have mentioned is that uh, the bigger question is how we will push yet another vote in Parliament, because for the actual start of the EU accession negotiations, Bulgaria has requested, and the European Commission has agreed, and most all of the other EU member states, that we actually change our constitution again, 
but I felt that this was too sad to discuss, so let's keep it to the essence. Uh, so Bulgaria has requested that we change our constitution again to add the Bulgarian community to our constitution. So in order to actually start the accession negotiations in the next year or two, we are now in a phase where uh, you need to actually amend the constitution um, again. Uh, and that's the, the risk that uh, we see with uh, the opposition that again left the parliamentary hall when this was discussed uh, in, the, in the short term. That brings us to your question of the ethnicity. For the Albanian community, this does not hit hard. And this country is built uh, always in government has a coalition of an Albanian and a Macedonian partner. We have never had in history a single party uh, government. There was all, this is not a rule, it's an informal rule. But you always have two parties uh, in government. Uh, one Albanian, one Macedonian in the list. Uh, likely on the 2024 elections, if we don't change the constitution by then, and the government now does not have the majority, in order to build a coalition with an Albanian party, uh, with an Albanian party, Vomero will have this condition to uh, change the constitution. This will be an in intra-party coalition deal. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why they will not play with PRESPA, because for the Albanian community, PRESPA is a done deal. We got it off our chest. It doesn't really hurt us. And uh, because the government is built on such, uh, the, the country is built on such inter-ethnic coalitions, uh, inter coalitions, then uh, this, this is what is also increases the likelihood of them not going completely off the rails, but that we will see. Uh, the European political community uh, was a nice summit. Um, I would, it's after all that I mentioned here uh, and the expectations, I think that uh, it's very difficult, especially for this generation in the country, to talk about any type of other types of EU membership or EU association than something that would lead to full membership. So, I mean, especially not this summit that could the, the, the best it could do was a statement with the UK, which is commendable as I find it. So I, I don't think that would be something. Um, uh, the Serbia. Uh, I don't think that the disappointment, Serbia is a very specific case. Uh, I don't think that the disappointment in Serbia is comparable at this point uh, to, to Macedonia. Because Serbia actually has the meddling and the use of Russia in the discussion. In, in our case, I really, I mean, if, even if you see Russia here occasionally, it's, we've not been interested in Russia, thank the Lord, they should forget about us, so uh, it's, we've been off the radar, so I think it's, it's, in Serbia the discussion is very different. Uh, Macedonia has aligned 100% with EU sanctions from the beginning. We did have a certain time, for example, after 2000, because most of the country is aligned after 2014, actually, Albania, Albania was since 2014. We did not align fully in 2014 because we have an export of specific type of peaches to which, which could only go to Russia. But this year we said, you know, the peaches don't matter, we go full on. I mean, this was the only exception that we had from 2014. We even aligned then with, uh, with Crimea and Donbass. So I don't think that it's, it's comparable. Serbia has had different experiences. Thank God we, we, did, not have, uh, we did not have those. Uh, but um, Serbia is very important because uh, there is generally, as a result of uh, the EU uh, disappointment, uh, the actor that has been rising in the region in terms of its influence is exactly Serbia. And uh, a lot of the people in North Macedonia for the first time after two, three decades do see Serbia as the biggest partner of the country, which was very, which was very strange. But it's not strange if we go back to the fact that uh, in the pandemic, uh, President Vucic, when they had vaccines that were expiring over a certain weekend in the May or uh, in March, the last weekend of March 2020, which was when uh, most of the region did not have vaccines, he opened up the borders and he said everyone from the region is welcome to come and uh, have their uh, anti-COVID vaccine here. Uh, and this was a, a very a big, a big support to his popularity in the region in, in terms of a people-to-people -people dimension. Uh, which, but there's other reasons. If there's anyone interested, we can discuss about that later. Turkey, yes. In effect, the other actor that we should look at in North Macedonia is Turkey, yet not comparable to Bosnia. I mean, Bosnia has, in Bosnia, Turkey has a specific interest. In North Macedonia or in the region, we should also, I'm not even sure we can look at 
Turkey as a third actor. I mean, we've had these discussions also with some of the authors that work on this. And I'm here of the opinion that Bechev has, that Turkey has been always in the region. You know, Turkey has very much links uh, with the diaspora. They have a lot of people that they relate to. For those of you, uh, I mean, just in terms of that, uh, remember trivia points, uh, Kemal Ataturk, the father of modern Turkey, was actually educated in Macedonia in a small town in the south. So there's a, there's a specific link. Economically, it's incomparable to what Greece is. Greece, is, Greece and Germany are our bigger, uh, biggest economic investment partners, Germany topping the, topping the list. Uh, but uh, Turkey does have some strategic uh, uh, investments, such as the airport, because they, uh, it's run by TAF. And it ha it's very much uh, present in the uh, medical services, just as everywhere in the region. Private hospitals are usually, there's one or two big private hospitals that are always managed by Turkey. And in the, in the schools, uh, the foundation of uh, Turkey deals also with, uh, is one of the biggest donors. We're not even sure where that, where that money uh, goes, but there's also the question of having some of the good private schools, uh, both at elementary and uh, middle uh, level that probably are associated to Gulen as well. I mean, Turkey does not have such a huge economic uh, footprint, but I would not dismiss it as, I would not dismiss it as irrelevant in any, uh, in any case. Uh, the two questions were linked, the economic aspects of European integration. Um, Neoliberal policies were introduced in North Macedonia, unfortunately, already in the early 1990s. We had a very questionable uh, privatization process. And uh, what we are looking at now is uh, this region in general, and uh, I think North Macedonia and Kosovo probably uh, top the list, have one of the biggest uh, inequality indices in the region. So our Gini coefficient is skyrocketing. Um, we used to have uh, an economy which ran about 30% of unemployment as a result of uh, the bad transformation that was not in the 1990s. A lot of the big enterprises actually falling completely uh, apart. Uh, which meant uh, now the unemployment is down to about 16-17% as a result of the fact that a lot of those people actually died, that were unemployed, they were structurally unemployed from the, from the previous system. So unemployment is, uh, is going uh, down. The uh, liberalization of trade and services with the EU actually happened with the Stabilization Association Agreement in a lot of these countries. We, uh, I mean, our trade with, uh, the, in terms of uh, economy, uh, you would find us as this huge exporter of automotive industry parts, which is a result of one factory investment by the UK, Johnson Matty, that does its uh, spare parts in, uh, in the country. Uh, this region is largely still operating on so-called free economic zones, in which investors from the outside come and invest, usually don't associate with the local economy, unfortunately. Uh, so it's a bit of an in and out. This is what, unlike, with the only exception, probably the German companies are some trying and the strategic investments that the Greek companies have because they have investments in the banks, in our oil supply, uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, the impact of uh, the uh, transformation process that, have, that is yet to come with accession will be bad, but not as bad as. You, you can't, you, not as bad as one can uh, foresee it because of this already uh, existing uh, integration that, uh, that uh, we have. Um, in effect, uh, in this region, because of uh, a lot of the neoliberal policies that were already there, uh, the EU might be even seen as a tool to foster social dialogue, which is not something that is the case here, but often the European integration is also used as a benchmark as a way to actually bring the syndicates and the association of the workers back to the back to the to the table, which is a very um, uh, counterintuitive uh, situation uh, uh, than uh, than we see in the EU member states, and also uh, some of these, let's say, um, uh, externally managed firms, such as, for example, German investments or so on, or so on and so forth, have been shown uh, to actually be, uh, in the national context, better respectful of uh, workers' rights than, than some of the national ones were, I mean, as crazy as it sounds. Uh, the region, uh, I mean, North Macedonia um, uh, has, uh, and the region in general, have a thriving service industry, especially in the IT sector, which actually is not expected to be 
that much uh, affected because it's actually uh, mental, it's uh, uh, human power which might go away, might not go away, but it's now also surviving on, on outsourcing from primarily also from, uh, from the uh, US. Uh, the uh, so I think that in this sense the economic uh, these I think that I showed that on the slide here the economic dimension is seen as one of the better aspects in terms of preparedness uh, at uh, this point as crazy as it sounds. Okay, so thank you very much. We have come to the end uh, of this first wonderful uh, Europe Promotion Seminar. So thank you very much, uh, thank Simonida. You. Thank you very much.